Good evening, everybody. Uh, before we begin, if I could ask you, I'm sure this isn't an unfamiliar uh, request, to silence your cell phones. And also, please join us at the book signing that's going to take place upstairs in the main lobby following tonight's event. Uh, welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Hey, I'm Jason. I work here in the Author Events Office, and I'm very excited to be here tonight to introduce Seth Graham Smith. Uh, author, television and film producer, and screenwriter Seth Graham Smith is famous for his genre-bending New York Times bestsellers, Pride and Prejudice, and Zombies, of course, and Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. The latter was adapted into a popular 2012 film uh, for which he also wrote the screenplay. Uh, tonight's author also penned How to Survive a Horror Movie, a, celebra a celebratory history of dirty movies called The Big Book of Porn, which is my favorite title, uh, ever. Uh, a Marvel comic about a zombified Incredible Hulk, which you should probably read because it's incredible. I read it. Uh, and a novel, dark reimagining of the tale of the Magi. And a screenplay uh, for Tim Burton's Dark Shadows remake. And about a million other projects that you're going to hear about tonight. Uh, he's also the creator of the cult CBS online series Clark and Michael and the MTV series The Hard Times of R.J. Berger. And, oh yes, uh, he's currently writing the sequel to the 1988 ultra-classic Beetlejuice. No pressure whatsoever. In The Last American Vampire, tonight's author brings us the much-anticipated sequel to Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. It's a tale of a Byronic bloodsucker's search for purpose and sustenance in a 20th century populated and shaped by the undead. Ladies and gentlemen, won't you please uh, join me in welcoming Seth Graham Smith. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Thank you guys um, for that. Was, it's so weird. It's so formal. It's like I'm on an award show or something. Um, thank you guys for braving the cold to come out on a, uh, a weeknight. Um, and uh, this is cool. This is my first time talking about uh, this book anywhere. Uh, it just came out today. Uh, and you guys are the, the sort of test audience. Usually, you know, it takes me a couple times uh, of doing this to get my whole wrap down about what I want to talk about. So I'm just going to ramble a little bit, forgive me, uh, and, uh, and lucky you guys. So uh, I thought rather than, you know, just sit here and read the book to you, which always strikes me as weird, having, you know, coming out and having people read a book to you. Why not just read it yourself? Uh, I would I would talk instead about how it sort of came to be and what the 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 whole journey of getting to this point was like because it's been kind of a really weird and interesting five years um, getting to this point uh, or six years now actually um, so like Jeff said I in 2009 I was uh, working basically writing. Uh, Books you, I, there's no other way to describe it. Books you read in the bathroom uh, for a really cool company here in Philly, uh, based out of Philly, called Quirk Books. And, uh, you know, you would know them for Worst Case Scenario, Survival Guide, and, and books like that. And uh, so I'd written things like The Big Book of Porn, um, which, you know, I always say, you know, a lot of people turn to porn earlier in their careers when they need the money, and I'm no different. Uh, and uh, I wrote a book about Spider-Man. I wrote a book about President Bush. I wrote a book about uh, uh, I wrote a book about horror movies. And uh, and you know it was interesting and it was thrilling, sort of getting published and everything. And I was just happy to have any kind of work because at that point, for about ten years, I'd been living out in L.A. and doing the typical L.A. wannabe writer thing, which is writing bad scripts that nobody wants to read and lo and behold nobody reads them uh, and just trying to break in and I was living you know week to week paycheck to paycheck and it was great when I had the opportunity to write a book uh, for very little money but you know, that wasn't the point you know the point was that I was getting published and and so then one day you know I'm talking to my editor this guy Jason and uh, and I'm saying I said you know I, 
it'd be great if we could do something fictional. You know, I mean, I, I'm dying to write something fictional. I mean, all my scripts and whatever, you know, how that I'm trying to get off the ground out here are all fiction. And, and he said, well, you know, it's not really our thing, but if, you know, we could come up with some kind of bent to it or some kind of weird. And it was Jason who came up with the idea of taking a classic piece of literature and subverting it, which led to Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Uh, and I wrote that book in 2009 or 2008, actually, and it came out in 2009. I wrote it in about six weeks, just a mad dash. And, you know, I think that you sell like 5,000 copies of those types of books and you're considered a success. And, and I expected that that would be just another case of us selling 5,000 copies. And I'd be happy that I got to write something funny and fictional. And, um, and instead it became a big hit and it, and it, you know, sort of got me on the, the, the publishing radar. And all of a sudden, you know, these, uh, New York publishers started calling and, and, uh, asking, well, what else do you have? What else do you have? And, uh, I had a thing that I was kind of thinking about and I thought, no, it's too stupid. Uh, but I was tinkering with it, tinkering with this outline, reading all these books about Abraham Lincoln, reading all these books about the civil war and trying to convince myself this idea I had was too stupid and I should let it go. Uh, and it probably is too stupid, but I ended up writing the book anyway. Uh, so I had this, I don't know, 50 page presentation that I put together, uh, you know, about, Here's a sample chapter. Here's what I'm thinking. Here's what the book looks like for Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. And thinking that this will chase all these New York publishers away. They'll think I'm an idiot and I can go back to writing books for Quirk in Philly and just live my life. And, and they said, this is great. This is great. You know, it's genius. And, the, you know, what, well, I don't know. This was also a long, this was five years ago and publishing was an eternity ago, by the way, because there were twice as many bookstores in the United States and people still, you know, browse bookstores and went to uh, people unlike yourself who are in a library. I understand we're talking about the general population here, not the people in this room. Um, and I wrote that book and that book became a bigger hit and hooray for me and everything. And, and you know, and it it uh, and Tim Burton bought up the movie rights and and all of a sudden I'm in a room with Tim Burton and all of a sudden I'm, you know, it's it's like the only way to describe it is just you feel like you're you feel like uh, you hear this all the time, but you're living someone else's life and you're just getting whisked around. and It's crazy. And, you know, I'm on the road and I'm talking to nice people like you about books. And, and this is like six months after I'm, you know, doing a, a, a script layout for a, a Food Network show, you know, which, by the way, I'm really good at. I did that for years. You know, those, those, when you watch those shows about like house hunters, I used to work on that. Um, Bobby Flay, you know, these like cooking shows, home and garden stuff. And you look at those, you don't realize that someone has to write all that stuff. You know, someone has to look at all the tape they shoot and then figure out where the narrator is going to go. But Susie didn't have the garden she thought she was going to, you know, like someone actually has to write all that stuff. And, and that was me for years and years and years. And, uh, and I'm glad I don't do that anymore, but but I'll probably go back to it at some point. Uh, so so after and that was all in the space of a year from from the Pride and Prejudice book coming out to Tim Burton saying I want to make this into a movie was a year. It was a really crazy year, and I had you know baby, and and all of a sudden like uh, you know I can quit my job at at the Food Network stuff and and. It was just a crazy sort of magical year. Uh, and, you know, and then we begin the process of making the movie of Vampire Hunter. And, you know, I, I mean, I've been trying to write movies for years and trying to break in, but I've never actually been in the process before. And so that began a two year, very interesting, very enlightening process of what it's like to see your your book become a movie. Um, you know, it's interesting. The when you're writing a novel, it's, it's as pure a distillation of your voice as a writer as you're ever going to get. It's just you and the, the keyboard. And then you go through one filter, which is your editor, uh, other than your own internal filter. So when you're writing a book, that's your voice. When you're writing a movie or a television show, 
there you will become the servant of many masters and you become beholden to other more powerful voices than yours namely in a movie a director or a studio or a network or whatever it is and it's um it, it can be a very interesting very frustrating process and you have to sort of learn how to compartmentalize your brain all right i'm not the author today i am the the lowly screenwriter you know and then shift that back into i am the invincible novelist again when you get back to you know writing your books uh but it was an interesting two years and you know the movie turned out wildly different from the book and and you know absolutely crazy uh and but it, for what it's worth it led to me having a screenwriting career uh uh i the same summer that the abraham lincoln vampire hunter movie came out i wrote a movie called dark shadows for tim burton and yeah somebody groaned and that always happens the people who love the dark shadows series hate that movie with a passion a passion and i'll tell you why because it's campy and because we took the piss out of it and because the people who love dark shadows love them some dark shadows and think that it is the best show in the history of shows and i respect it i respect it i don't agree with it but i respect it i also think it's funny when people ask me why did you decide to write a campy dark shadows movie now let's analyze that statement for a second okay i'm a second time screenwriter writing a 160 million dollar johnny depp and tim burton movie what decisions do you think i make other than yes, Johnny, yes, Tim, yes, Warner Brothers, thank you. May I have another? So this guy's shaking his head like, I still hate you. I still hate you. I hate that movie so much. People take that movie so seriously. I mean, it, it's, a, it's astonishing. Everywhere I go, there's a Dark Shadows hater for the rest of my life, and it's just one of those things I'm going to have to own. And that's all right. That's all right. You can't please them all. That movie didn't please many at all, but uh, you definitely can't please them all, and you definitely can't please the fans of the, uh, of the, the Jonathan Frid, uh, uh, Barnabas Collins, you know, uh, all 5,000 of them. So they're dying off quickly, which is good for me. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sure that's going to be tweeted out now. I'm going to have Dark Shadows fans all over my butt, but that's okay. That's life. Uh, so I have a, a, an interesting summer where, you know, two movies come out. Both movies aren't well received. Both movies don't work financially, critically. And I think, all right, well, that was a fun couple of years of, you know, doing it. And, and I'll go back to writing these books now. And, and, you know, Hollywood will just leave me alone and that'll be it. And, you know, this crazy thing happens in Hollywood. You get to fail upwards. And it's unbelievable. It's like working in banking. It's incredible. It's like the more mistakes you make, the more money you lose people, uh, the more people want you to lose money for them. I don't understand it, uh, but I thank, uh, I thank my lucky stars for it every day. Uh, I plan on having many failures for years to come in Hollywood. I'm working on it right now. Um, so, you know, Warner Brothers, instead of kicking me off the lot and, and putting a photo on the gate that says, do not let this, you know, idiot in ever again, uh, gives me a two-year deal to have a company and to, uh, to develop more things for them. And, uh, and so I, you know, uh, I write uh, a Beetlejuice sequel that is still kicking around and, you know, talk about – now, you want to talk about – offending, you know, the people who go to the Dark Shadows convention at the Burbank Airport Hilton every year versus the people who love Beetlejuice. I mean, it's like touching a nine volt battery versus touching the third rail on the subway in terms of how dangerous that is to your career. OK, the, you know, it, nothing scares me more than that movie getting made or excites me more than that movie getting made, because I could get it 99% right and I'll never hear the end about the 1%. You know, like that's a no win situation for that movie. But, you know, let's let's hope it gets made and my career gets ruined once and for all anyway. Uh, and uh, and also at Warner Brothers, I get pulled into uh, the crazy Lego universe where uh, I'm now producing one of the, the next two Lego movies and writing the other one. I'm writing the, the Lego Batman movie based on the Will Arnett Batman in uh, the Lego movie. And uh, we're producing um, 
Ninjago based on the popular Ninjago line of toys. Uh, any of you have kids under the age of 10, or boys especially between the ages of you know 4 and 10, you know what Ninjago is. I did not before this project, but now I'm well versed in, uh, in Ninjago. Uh, so after Lincoln, you know, I'm kind of sitting around going, all right, well, you know, I want to keep writing books because all this other stuff that I'm doing in TV or in movies and stuff, you know, I'm, I'm beholden to, to all these different voices and I'm not really the boss and I'm part of a team, which is great. And I'm learning a lot about it, but at the same time, you know, it's, there's nothing as fun as sitting down and, and having that pure distillation of voice. Uh, even if it ends up being terrible, it's your terrible. Uh, and you know that in your heart and you can own it and feel the shame, really feel the shame firsthand, uh, <laughs> which is great. Uh, so I wrote a book uh, called Unholy Night, which I really like and which was really well received. It just didn't sell well because it was sort of campy and weird and everything, but not campy and weird enough. And people were sort of confused by what it was. And it was about the three wise men and how they met and what they were really doing that night in the manger. Uh, it was kind of like a swashbuckling version of the nativity. Um, and Warner Brothers bought that and said, we're going to turn it into a big biblical movie. And, and then all these biblical movies flopped. And they said, we're going to put it on a shelf where it'll probably reside for years to come. Uh, but uh, it was fun writing that book, even though it didn't sell. And the whole time that, I don't know how many of you read the first Lincoln book. Maybe a few of you did. But at the end of the first Lincoln book, uh, there's a little epilogue that sort of hints at the fact that there may be some stuff that happens after the end of the book that we don't know about. You know, more to come. And, uh, and I kept thinking about that. And, you know, I kept thinking about the fun that I had had writing that book. It was such a sort of carefree experience. I didn't sit down and just agonize over it. It just kind of came all out and it was, it, it was so weird and so stupid that it just, it, you know, why sit there and, and agonize over every word? And so I loved having that experience and I wanted to go back and, and live in that world again and play with those characters. I thought that, you know, well, we ended right after the Civil War and Here's the 20th century with all this stuff, the American century, the birth of industry and two world wars and Vietnam and Kennedy and the space program and, and Reagan and, and, you know, the birth of the, uh, the Soviet Union and, and, uh, and Hitler. And, you know, think about it, all these crazy figures and all these crazy uh, pieces of important tectonic world shifts that you could – you know, subvert and probably ruin by weaving vampire history into them. So uh, it was it was too big an opportunity, and I kept thinking about how uh, how to do it. And and what I usually do is I'll go and I'll go and read other books about it. In in the case of the first Lincoln book, you know, uh, I read Gore Vidal's Lincoln, I read Team of Rivals, I read Lincoln Letters from the Lincoln Library, I, you know, uh, I read Correspondence, um, and just trying to get a sense of who this guy was, like with Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, even though it was like a six-week crazy mad dash to write that, I wanted my stupid zombie editions to be as authentic to that text and be invisible if you were reading it for the first time, where you wouldn't know where the Jane Austen ended and the uh, Seth Graham Smith dumb guy began. And so I really, you know, I read her books again just because I wanted to get a sense of, it's a very specific thing writing Jane Austen. It's not that easy. Let me tell you, she's a pretty damn good writer. Uh, I don't know if many of you know that about Jane Austen. She's not a bad writer, having worked with her one time. Uh, so, uh, you know, so I think people say, well, that book created this whole mashup thing. I don't think that's necessarily true. It certainly popularized it. But the idea of what mashup was sort of became blurred and you know all of a sudden now you've got people self-publishing on Amazon like you know Hitler versus werewolves and and there's actually a movie called Jesus Christ zombie hunter or something like that or vampire hunter vampire hunter yeah it's a comic book right okay so like it's you know so I'm, I'm so proud of this whole industry <laughs> 
that we've spawned, you know, really just, you know, doing right by, by literature. I'm looking forward to the day where, you know, every library has a, a, a little bust of Plato and of, you know, of, of C.S. Lewis and of, you know, Stephen King and then me just sitting there going, you know, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but, uh, but what I'm trying to say, this is all a point of saying that what I tried to do, and the point that I always try to make about these dumb books that I write is that I work really, really hard on them. And I feel like the more absurd your premise is, the more you owe it to the reader to make it as believable as you can. And so many of these books, and I've read them and some of the comics, you know, you know, they spend so much time winking at the reader, I call it. It's going, hey, this is dumb, right? We're all in on the joke, right? I think that's a terrible idea. I think that from the outset, and it's why I use so many journal entries and newspaper article entries and, and why I, I start the books and end the books sometimes with, with fake prologues and, you know, because I want to ground you in this idea that what you're reading is plausible and not only plausible, but probable. And I make sure my history is correct. I make sure that, you know, the voices of the people that I'm writing uh, in are as authentic as I can possibly make them. And you know, I work hard on trying to craft a tone and craft, you know, uh, a, a story that, you know, seems as seamless as it could possibly be in the context of the history I'm writing about. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm some great hero for doing that. I'm just saying, why wouldn't you do that? Um, it seems crazy to spend all the time and energy on, on writing a book and not actually, you know, do that work. So this is all a long way of saying that I got to this uh, and I thought it would be fun to go back, and it was, uh, but it was also a lot harder the second time. And it was a lot harder the second time because I knew there would be an expectation uh, of a lot of people, two million people bought the first book, um, which is crazy. So not that this book's gonna sell two million copies, you know, I'll be lucky if I sell a tenth of that, frankly. I'll be, if I sell a tenth of that, it'll be a huge hit because of the way that publishing's changed in the last five years. But it was hard because I was now nervous about offending people or disappointing, rather is the better word, people who really liked the first book. Uh, so I may have been overcautious and I may have been over sensational, I'm not sure, people will have to tell me. But I just thought, you know what, I'm gonna do such a, I'm going to take the story of the first book, which was the story of one kid growing up, fighting in the Civil War and getting shot in the back of the head, and I'm going to blow it up. Like, you know, I think this is probably fell into the trap that all sequels fall into, which is I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to do it on 8,000 pounds of steroids, which is essentially what this book is. It is, you know, it is Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter with uh, way more characters way more historical intersections and way more violence and dare I say some sex for the first time in my career which I'm really nervous about which was really weird writing I must say it's really weird writing the inner monologue of a uh, uh, 19th century English prostitute I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say it was really weird uh, but enticing but weirdly enticing uh, so and, you know, the book is uh, the story of Abe's, it's really the story of Abe's mentor in his uh, fifth century of life. And, and the reason it's called The Last American Vampire is because the 20th century was the American century. And he is sort of the quintessential American, and he's, you know, for more, for better or worse, he is one of the last of his kind. In the wake of what happened in the first book, all these vampires are getting chased around and killed off. and and uh, you know the the eternal earth is kind of a dying breed, and so it's his experience and Abe's at some points of all the terrible and wonderful things that happen specifically in America, but also around the world in the 20th century. Um, I'm getting that thing that happens in my head where I feel like you know everyone's eyes are glazing over and I'm rambling, and I start to hear my own voice, and I go, "We should really open it up for questions." So uh, you know. Let's open it up for questions. I don't know how this works, but uh, I, I do better with a with a discussion than I do with a lecture. I hate lecturing. They're gonna get a mic to you. Not that I need it to hear you in the second row, but uh, I guess in the in the in the name of being formal, sure, yeah.
uh, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies now being turned into a, a movie. How uh, involved were you with that uh, script writing process, especially with David O. Russell getting the first draft of it? The, uh, the, uh, the people, oh, there we go. The, uh, well, the people who hated Dark Shadows would be so happy to know I did not write the screenplay uh, for PPZ. Uh, David O. Russell, uh, the, weirdly, wrote the screenplay. I mean, I, I guess it was before he was the Oscar-nominated fighter and uh, American hustle, David O. Russell. I mean, he was still a big name and a big director. Uh, but he was going to direct it for a while. That book, um, Natalie Portman bought the movie rights to it when it came out. And it was going to be a Natalie Portman playing Lizzie, uh, directed by David O. Russell and written by David O. Russell. Uh, and then the way things do in Hollywood, that fell apart and got rebuilt 20 times uh, until this cast and this director were able to make it happen. They just wrapped in November. So the movie will be out sometime at the end of this year or the beginning of next year. Um, but my job is to show up at the premiere and go, hey, you know, and just keep my fingers crossed that it's, uh, that it's really good. I've seen some stuff from it, and I've, I've read the drafts that they've done, and, and I think this director, Burr Steers, and, uh, who also did a rewrite on the draft, I think he did a really, really great job. And I think that, you know, again, what I was nervous about was this thing, they're going to take a joke and make a joke of it. When instead, I think the way to do something like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies is to just pretend you're making a Pride and Prejudice movie and never ever sort of acknowledge the, you know, the craziness of the fact that these, you know, Regency era aristocrats are being so prim and proper and, you know, completely uh, conforming to uh, societal uh, pressures and marital pressures and, you know, which which pinky you put up when you, uh, when you drink your tea. And meanwhile, their country's burning down around them and people are getting beheaded in the streets. I just think that's funny. And I think that, <laughs> I think that, and I think that Jane Austen thought that was funny about how, you know, a woman is nothing if she's married, even if she's the greatest woman who ever, you know, who ever lived. Uh, and all I did in the book, and I think what they're doing in the movie, is taking that idea and just cranking the volume up to an absurd level. But, but it's all the same, I mean, thematically, in terms of what Lizzie's going through, in terms of what the, uh, the expectations of women in that time were, and how stupid some of the men could be in that time. Who else has a question? That gentleman right there. I was just wondering, um, do you think when they had Forrest Gump kind of been placed in different parts of history, it kind of opened the door to saying, oh, we can take a, a moment in history, play it straight, but look at it from a different angle. And that kind of opens the door for a lot of uh, the stuff after that where we can take a piece of history and change it a little bit, but yet keep the historic aspect of it intact. Yeah, I think I thought about Forrest Gump a lot when I was writing um, the first book a little bit, but especially this book, because I thought, you know, it was a great example of how, um, how uh, someone had an extraordinary life and intersected all these extraordinary events. The, the, the difference I would say here is that Henry and Abe are actually, they're, they're actually affecting the outcome of these events in a, in a big way. Whereas, you know, you might see Forrest Gump shaking hands with Kennedy and saying, I have to pee or whatever, and that's the joke. I mean, you know, instead it's Abe and Henry sitting with Kennedy going, you know, uh, you're wrong, Mr. Kennedy. <laughs> We're going to do it this way. Or that's, that's actually not from the book. That was a terrible example, but you're wrong, Mr. Kennedy. Um, yeah, I, th I thought about it a lot. You know, in terms of, in terms of looking at uh, a familiar story from a different angle, though, there were some, some literary examples that predated... Pride and Prejudice and Zombies that were really, I mean, there was the book, um, the Gone with the Wind book from, uh, from uh, the slave's point of view called The Wind Done Gone, and there was uh, Wicked, you know, the looking at uh, The Wizard of Oz with a different lens. There's a long history of these books that are sort of subverting the traditional narrative. It's, you know, it's just none of them had zombies in them, I guess. Who else has a question? Young lady right there. Wait for the mic. 
So usually um, when a writer will like start with the book, they'll start at, like a conversation or some starting place. So where did you start with the second book? Uh, I started where I started in the store on East Market Street in Rhinebeck, New York, where the first book started. <laughs> and my my friend Chris here knows the story uh, very well. Um, uh, yeah, I just wanted to. So I started it from my point of view, or actually, sort of fictional me, saying, you know, this is in the first book. The prologue is, here's me. My name's Seth. I work at this store in Rhinebeck, New York, which is this real store on East Market Street, a real five and dime, uh, which was the five and dime is a, a dying breed of store. And so I thought it, it would be sort of a nice thematic similarity between, you know, what Henry was going through and Abe. And, um, and I write how I come to be in possession of these journals that were left behind by Abraham Lincoln that basically outlined his whole life story and his journals of him fighting against vampires and becoming a vampire hunter and why he had to keep it a secret and how it was actually his skills as a vampire hunter that were responsible for the Union winning the Civil War, right? So in this book, I do the same opening basically and say, all right, well, here I am four years later and, you know, nothing turned out the way I wanted it to. I thought that this book was going to change my life and uh, it didn't, and my, <laughs> I don't know why, it's so, it's really depressing now that I say it out loud, but it's like my, I write that my marriage is falling apart, and my kids don't like me, and I have no money, and it's like all these, you know, maybe subconsciously that's how I feel about myself, uh, but, uh, but that I basically am obsessed with this idea of finishing the story, of knowing more about what happened to Abe, and what happened to Henry, and and please, Henry, you've got to tell me more. And convincing Henry to tell me his life story. And in doing that, I'm basically, this book is sort of, it's, and I acknowledge this in the open, it's Interview with the Vampire. It's basically, but it's Interview with a Vampire that I created before and didn't mean to interview, but I'm now interviewing. You get it. So I'm ripping Anne Rice off, but I apologize. But I acknowledge that I'm ripping Anne Rice off in the open, which is, you know, there's no way, there's no way around it. She did it 40 years ago. Um, so that was, yes, that was the genesis of the book. And that sort of kicks off the whole idea of, well, what didn't we know about Henry from the first book and filling in the gaps? And what didn't we know about Abe? And then really what happened after that night at Ford's Theater? Uh, when, or, or rather, what happened after that night when Abe is basically interred in Illinois um, and uh, Henry has to decide whether or not he's going to resurrect him, you know? He does, because otherwise there'd be no book. But at the time, it was somewhat suspenseful. Someone on this side of the room, maybe. All sides of the room. Okay, excellent. Gentleman right there. You know you want to ask me something specific about Dark Shadows. I'm ready. I'm ready. Oh, no, not at all. No, um, no, no, this gentleman oh, okay. here. I'm sorry. I'm, just, I'm, I'm picking on him. I'm picking on him. Um, more about your writing process. What do you write on? Do you uh, computer, longhand, typewriter? Do you save revisions or just totally keep going and rewriting and rewriting? Yeah, I, I am. I'm a so I write uh, on computer, but I, I've I typically I have an office that I go to every day. I mean, as part of what I do in film and television, I have you know a company with a partner and some people that work for us and. Um, so I'm there Monday through Friday as my regular job. I'm there all day working on film and TV things or writing things at my desk. Um, I typically will sit at my desk and do two big blocks of writing, one block in the morning, then in the middle of the day I'll go and you know do whatever producerial things I have to do, phone calls, emails, meetings, and whatnot. And then in the afternoon I'll do another several hours of writing. Uh, and then when I'm really up against it, I'll add a third shift, I'll go home, put kids in the bathtub or to bed, and then drink a cup of coffee, say goodnight wife, and go into my home office and disappear until, you know, 12, 1 in the morning. Uh, but I like to do two shifts a day, every day, uh, seven days a week. I feel like it's it's like being an athlete or being, a, you know, uh, or being serious about anything. You have to just keep it going, keep it trained. I, I wrote today, two shifts today on my MacBook in the hotel room. Uh, I can write in coffee shops, I can write on trains, I can write on planes. Um, 
sometimes if I don't have a computer, I carry a little tiny Moleskine notebook and I'll just, you know, just dash off a couple of things. Uh, but, you know, there, Stephen King talks about treating writing as a job, and, and that's definitely my approach. I treat it as a job. I treat it as something I do rain or shine. Whether I'm feeling good about it or not, whether I'm writing anything worthwhile or not, I save every revision. Uh, I revise as I go, which is a terrible idea, uh, which is completely um, destructive to the creative process. I'll go back and obsess and say, well, that's horrible. And I'm getting better at it. I'm getting better at blazing through and then knowing that half of it will disappear later. Um, and part of that, I think, comes from working more in TV and in film where you know whatever you turn in, especially on these animated movies I'm working on now, I can turn in a whole uh, act of a movie, you know, some 30 pages of, you know, something that I think is really finely crafted and something I've really struggled with and sweat over. And I'll be lucky if two words of it end up in the movie, ultimately, because these are three-year processes and because you're part of a team and because the director's going to add something to it and the storyboard artists are going to add something to it. And, you know, it's just not going to feel right when you look at the sketches up there. I mean, it, there's so many, you know, ways to collaborate in making these movies that I think maybe it's, uh, maybe it's made me a little less uh, self-critical as a, as a novelist, which maybe that's a bad thing now that I say. I'm not, I'm not sure. Who else? No one's asking for Beetlejuice spoilers. This is unbelievable. Okay. This man. Um, did you uh, go with the original idea with the new Beetlejuice, whereas Hawaii, or did they let you go full stream what you wanted? No, we're not doing Beetlejuice Goes Hawaiian. Thank God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, that's a, I mean, it's, just, it's the scariest project I've ever been associated with. Because there's only, for me as a writer, I feel like there's only degrees of failure, you know? Uh, I, it, it, so the, the two things that I, because Warner Brothers came to my partner, my producing partner David and I and said, we want you guys to be the guys to, you know, reinvigorate this and find a way to do Beetlejuice again. And that scared me because I thought, well, they're talking about doing Beetlejuice again, which means that, you know, no offense to Russell Brand, but like, you're going to tell me Russell Brand's playing Beetlejuice and, you know, and, you know, uh, uh, somebody, some hot new actress is going to play uh, Lydia Dietz. And, like, that's just not, you know. So I told, I told Warner Brothers, I said, on, on two conditions will I do it, because I was scared of it. I said, one, I can't make it without Michael Keaton as Beetlejuice. Cannot do it. Game over. And, like, this was, you got to remember, two years ago, nobody's talking about Michael Keaton the way they're talking about him today with Birdman and he's going to win the Oscar and all that stuff. Like this was pre resurgence, Michael Keaton, still a great movie star and really popular, but not like not having a moment two years ago. And, uh, and I said, the other condition is Tim comes back to direct or game over. Cause I don't think anybody can do that movie. I mean, there's movies that lots of people can do. I don't think anybody can do Beetlejuice but Tim Burton. He created that whole aesthetic. That's the first time we saw Tim Burton's sort of weird universe fully realized. I mean, there was a little bit of it in Pee-wee's Big Adventure, but not as much. So they said, okay, great. And, you know, I talked to Tim about it, and I went and I sat down with Michael Keaton about it, and I said, I said, first of all, do you even want to do this? And he said, I've been dying to do this for... I almost did the voice. <laughs> I've been... I've been dying to do this for 25 years. Yeah. Uh, but he's been dying to put that suit on, he told me. Uh, and we sat there for a couple hours, and he told me some things that he thought would be a good idea and some things he th said, you should stay away from this. I took that to heart, and I went and I talked to Tim about it, and Tim said, here's what I'm interested in, and here's what I'm not interested in. I took all that and said, uh, and then, of course, the studio said, here's what we need, you know, just to make sure that, you know, there's a... Shirtless, uh, shirtless Channing Tatum in it somewhere, and we're, you know, that's not what they said, but, you know, they needed something, something, you know. And I took all those ingredients and I wrote a draft uh, uh, and then got notes and rewrote it again and got it to the point where Tim said, all right, this is great, and Keaton said, all right, this is great. Um, and that was not too long ago, and now 
we'll see. It's it comes down to scheduling, I think, because now Keaton's having a moment. It's gonna he's starting he's gonna start having all these offers come at him, and Tim is making Miss Peregrine's uh, at Fox, and that's gonna be the yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the Miss Peregrine's fans just got it very excited. That's his next movie. So he's making that a Fox, and that's going to be his year this year. So it's like we can't start shooting this year, and it's like, you know, it becomes this whole thing of, like, now I'm learning as a quote-unquote, I'm doing air quotes, producers. Uh, my producer hat on, I'm learning what a producer does, which is find a way to relentlessly, pardon my language, but annoy the shit out of people until they give you a green light, right? So... That's what I'm doing. I'm just being as annoying and as, and as loud as possible. I'm keeping on top of everybody saying, when are we going? When are we going? When are we going? Um, but there's a, there's, a, a lot of, there's a lot of love for the idea of that movie, and that's what scares me, but excites me. I should be excited. I am excited. I think we're all excited, too. Who else has a question? Yes. One more from this gentleman. All right. Um, have you just worked in the uh, studio system or have you tried like the uh, full mid-major independent thing at, at all? Yeah, I, um, both. You know, we're lucky enough to have some projects uh, uh, that we're doing with uh, financiers and, and things like that. Like you know, the cold hard reality about Hollywood movies now and that I think you've all noticed is that there's no – there's no middle-sized movies anymore, it doesn't seem, right? You either have to make a $200 million movie with a superhero in it that everybody's going to go see, or you have to find a way to make a horror movie or a tiny little comedy for $5 million or under. The days of, like, the $30 million, $20 million, you know, are, are over, and the reason for that is that nobody buys DVDs anymore. You know, there's no way for, you know, Hollywood can't figure out a way to monetize this whole, what they call the middle, right? So what's happening now is that a bunch of people like Megan Ellison, who, you know, has just got a billion dollars and says, I like good movies, is making great movies. And she's making, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson movies and David O. Russell movies. And it, these people who uh, have a lot of money and want to be in the movie business are now starting these finance companies and, and these little production companies. And they're giving money for these smaller films to get made. And, it's exciting. It's frustrating because you know you 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 don't want to always be working on a superhero script, but uh, at the same time, you know you, if you can find uh, I don't know what I'm going to say. If you can find if you can find uh, somebody who's as passionate about your idea as you are, then then there's still money to be found out there. But I mean, it sounds so weird. This is we're not we're not victims, you know what I mean? Like this is not a sob story. I'm telling you, oh, we can only get 10 million instead of you know 15 million for a movie. But it does it hurts us, you guys. It really does. Who else has a question? We'll do this young lady here, and then this gentleman over here. So, in terms of like uh, literary product projects, what's kicking around for you? Um. In terms of book projects, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. I've got here's 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 another thing that I'm kind of dealing with that's unexpected, and I think it kind of happened a little bit with Unholy Night, which was you know uh, coming off of Lincoln and and uh, coming off of Lincoln and Pride and Prejudice Zombies, I was the mashup guy, and you know which was great. It's great to be a guy or a girl of anything, I guess, you know, uh, but it kind of it, it it limits what you think of yourself and it limits what people think about you in terms of you know well the publisher is saying well we need Seth's next blah 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 book you know like I'm sure that there are a lot of people who'd be thrilled if I said I want to write you know write uh, George Washington werewolf tamer or something you know because they know how to sell that and they know that that you know people who liked the other two books will like that one and and they've got sort of a a, a saga that they can sort of show that's developing. Um, but you know, I, I grew up in a book friendly household. My, uh, stepfather ran a, uh, used and rare book dealer, uh, by mail order service. So like our whole basement in our house was 5,000 volumes 
uh, and he was really into fantasy and horror and sci-fi. So at a very young age, I was introduced to Kuntz and King and Ellison and Bradbury and Asimov and all these names were flying around our house and it was just very natural to sort of pick that stuff up as a kid. My mother was and still is a editor for a small book publishing companies. She's worked for several of them in, in her career and still works at one in Connecticut. And so, uh, you know, it was, uh, it, it was just sort of, I grew up on this diet of just sky's the limit fiction, whether it was sci-fi or horror or fantasy. And, you know, I, I'm not sure that I would be happy having a career of it's got to be this meets that, you know, or it's got to be so-and-so, but with a crazy twist, you know. I mean, I know that that would probably sell better. I'm not sure that that's a reason to do something, though, you know. So I'm trying to convince myself or rather give myself the courage to, you know, write that sci-fi book that I've been thinking about or to write that straight up old fashioned ghost story book that I've been thinking about. Um, and who knows, maybe, you know, my sales will just plummet and that, you know, and then I'll figure that out. That'll be fine. Yeah. I thought I saw a hand over here. Yeah. Hi, um, speaking of Bradbury, um, uh, what's the background of uh, the story of you scripting for uh, the story uh, Something Wicked This Way Come for Disney? Uh, I'm directing it. Oh, you're directing it? Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. So uh, a guy named David Leslie, David Leslie Johnson's writing the script. Uh, I wrote a treatment for it, but David's writing the script for it. Uh, now, I went to Disney because no book affected me more as a kid than that book. And I know that, you know, look, you think about it, like, I, I guess I must have, a, I must be a glutton for punishment because I always touch on these sacred texts. Dark Shadows, Beetlejuice, Jane Austen, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Ray Bradbury. Uh, we were discussing backstage about how people feel not only an ownership of Ray Bradbury's books, like I do, but also of the man Ray Bradbury. And so, you know, again, once again, I'm just touching the third rail and just saying, you know, I dare you to end my career, <laughs> you know, basically. And at some point it will, and you know, and then, then, uh, then you'll find me at the bar, I guess. But uh, tough business, Hollywood's tough business. Um, but uh, I went to uh, Disney and I said, you guys are sitting on the rights to this book, and you made this movie in 1983, which. There are parts of that movie I love. I love Jason Robard's performance in that movie. I love Jonathan Price's performance in that movie. I love some of the scenes in that movie. I remember being terrified of that movie when I was a kid. But I also remember that it didn't capture some of the things that I felt when I read that book when I was 13 years old and just fell in love with this story and, and, and this beautifully written book. And, uh, and it was a very special story to me. And I realized that the movie, going back and watching it a decade later, it doesn't age well. It hasn't really, it, it's not one of those movies that you throw on and go, oh, it's just like it was in 83. You really see the age of it. Um, you really sort of, it, it, it misses certain elements of the book that I wish had it included. And it's not a movie that any kid is talking about anymore. You know, no 13 year olds going around going, you know, yeah, hey, have you seen that something wicked this way comes? I mean, you ask any 13 year old kid walking down the street, do you know who Beetlejuice is? They'll go, yeah, it's that guy in the striped suit, the crazy hair, right? You ask any 13 year old, you know, have you seen this movie, something, or do you even know the story of something wicked this way comes? Nine times out of 10, at least they're going to say no. And I think that's a shame. I think that it's a story that could really affect every young person if they see this movie and hopefully read the book too and 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 you know maybe it can serve as a bridge between that so you know I, I I know that Hollywood is out of ideas I know that it's all remakes reboots and sequels but in this case I think that there is an audience for it a big audience that that would be surprised by it and could really benefit from it so it, the scripts being written right now uh, Hollywood movies move at a glacial pace so you know, my realistic hope for it is that we're talking about dates and sets and sometime by the end of this year. We'll see. Time for a couple more. Who else has a question? Lady there in the back. Okay. If you could just wait for the mic, please. 
I'm wondering where, where the self-deprecation comes from. Oh, the self-deprecation uh, comes from where all self-deprecation comes from, insecurity and fear. Uh, the, the belief that you are a charlatan, that you will be found out at any moment, that they will revoke your, your author license or your Hollywood you know, parking permit. Uh, I think that I, I have not met, well, I have met them and they're usually on insufferable, frankly, but like, you, you, I think you can either mask it one of two ways by being self deprecating or be, by being so wildly bombastically, you know, confident or faux confident. Uh, but as writers, I think if you're not asking questions of yourself and if you're taking yourself seriously, then you're missing the point. Like, you know, I'm lucky to have this job. I'm lucky that I get to do this for a living. There are lots of people who would love to do this for a living. And a lot of those people who want it probably have more talent than I do, but I have enough talent and I have the right timing where I got to do it. And I think you have to appreciate that. Otherwise, you get complacent and you start to believe your own hype and you start to go, hey, maybe I am really this good, right? And that's when you get lazy and that's when you, you know, start doing bad work. That's how I think of it anyway. I mean, I, you know, I also believe that if you read something you wrote a year ago and you go, wow, that's really good, then you have a problem. And the problem is that you have stagnated, that your growth has stopped. If you read something you wrote a year or two ago and go, this is terrible, then you should be happy because you've grown as a writer. Um, the minute I read uh, uh, something, you know, I'll go back and look at these books from time to time and I'll go, oh God, what a missed opportunity, or oh, what a terribly worded sentence, or oh, what a hackneyed piece of dialogue. And I'm glad that I discovered those things because it means that I've still got something to learn. The day I don't have anything to learn as a writer, I'm dead. I might as well just punch out because, you know, then what's the point? Then you're just going to do the same thing again and again and again. One or two more? Right here? You've really separated yourselves here and made it hard on the, <laughs> the poor people with the microphones. So it sounds like you've had one heck of a literary childhood. How did you make the decision to go with Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice as your first attack? I, I, I can't take credit for suggesting Pride and Prejudice. It was Jason, who, my editor, who suggested Pride and Prejudice as being ripe territory. Uh, and I think it was a, a brilliant suggestion because it was – it was really, if you think about it, I didn't, I didn't appreciate at the time, like, the power of the Austinites, uh, this worldwide organization. I mean, if you think the, the Dark Shadows people, you know, came after me with their pitchforks. Now, I was scared at some point. Like, I was like, I was like Salman Rushdie scared when that book started to, when that book started to take off because... It was like, you know, if, if the Austinites had collectively decided that I needed to go, then I was gone. Luckily, here's the thing about the Austinites. They're really funny. Like, they have a sense of humor because it turns out that Jane Austen's really funny and witty and biting and sarcastic and all those things we love about Jane Austen's writing. And, you know, there is probably an 80-20 split within fans of Jane Austen. I'll get the you know, the, the eight who say, you made me appreciate a book that I loved and read every year in a whole new way, and you made me laugh, right? And then I'll get the two who, you know, a pox on your house, how dare you, all that stuff. And so, you know, I w when it comes to Dark Shadows, I wish I had an 80-20. I have like a 10-90 in the other direction. Oh, speaking of which, yes, yes, he's got, he's going to do it. Here we go. The airing of the grievances. It's... <laughs> It's, yes. Um, yes, sir. Speaking of, I mean, The Dark Shadow, like I said, I seen the movie, and I feel like, I mean, even my mom seen it. And we both, like, sat there and looked at each other like, who the hell wrote this garbage? <laughs> and then we were like, wait a minute, we were like, okay, John, and I had a lot of respect for Johnny Depp yeah. and Tim Burton. Not no more. Dark Shadow, that was it for me. That was it? Yeah, that Have was you, it. Oh, we well, got I was like, I was like, no more. Johnny Depp need to get a new career. Tim Burton needs to go somewhere. 
I mean, it, like I said, it kind of destroyed my childhood because I it destroyed your it destroyed see, your childhood. I, I grew up watching Dark Shadows. Man, I'm a big Dark Shadow fan. Sure. And that movie, man, I was like, what the hell, like? I know, I know. Well, my mom was a big Dark Shadows fan, and you know, we don't talk about that movie. We, we sort of pretend it never happened. Like, I'm sure she's proud of me. I got to meet a Hollywood movie and all that stuff. We don't talk about it. It's the same thing. Y you know what? There was a conscious choice uh, by Tim and Johnny and everybody who made the movie that they weren't going to do the straight-up gothic Dark Shadows, that for it to work for a lot of people, when you're making a movie for that many, and I don't, again, I'm justifying it. I'm not saying it's a great movie. I'm not saying I didn't make mistakes. I'm not saying that, you know, uh, but... When you make a movie for that many people and they're spending that much money on it, and it's a Tim Burton, it's the eighth Tim Burton Johnny Depp collaboration, there's an expectation once again, and there's you know you can't make it for the 5,000 people who are the members of the Dark Shadows fan club to this day. You just can't. The economics don't work, and so when you make that choice and you make a choice to make it broad and you make it campy and humorous, the fact is you're going to piss a lot of people off. Absolutely, um, but you know again, even though it's quote unquote a failure, it made a quarter of a billion dollars at the box office worldwide. And you know, while that's probably five hundred million dollars less than Warner Brothers would have liked it to make, it's you know, if we had made the the sort of the Jonathan Frid, you know, shaky camera, boom mic in the shot version of of Dark Shadows that we all remember watching, uh, then, you know, it it would have I think I think that it would have it would have fared pretty poorly. We're no, planning to do a sequel. <laughs> do you know how Hollywood works? Planning to do a sequel? Oh, no. no, planning to do a sequel. We nearly tanked the studio. We're not. There's no sequel to that movie. All right, you guys. Uh, well, you got a free gem tonight: George Washington Werewolf Tamer. So get home and write that. But before you do. Join us upstairs for a book signing, and won't you please give a warm Thank you very much, guys. You guys are awesome. Thank you.